does democracy create growth? And who cares? Perhaps that's one of the most facile questions ever. I mean, surely democracy has more to recommend it than the fact that it can return a decent investment for pension funds and asset managers and things like that. But it is an interesting question to postulate whether or not there's some sort of connection between forms of government and economic outputs. This might come under the umbrella term of political economy, where political science and economics just get sort of mushed together to try and work out if we can share some of our findings together. So we will start, as ever, by trying to deconstruct the question and define our terms. This is only a four word question. Does democracy create growth? But even with such a modest number of words, we would still expect you in an Oxford interview, exam, essay, etc., to get under the skin of those words. When academics create questions, when they construct them, they do so deliberately and carefully. And so we expect the same sort of deliberation and care from those that are deconstructing our questions. So if you've been asked in an interview setting, for example, does democracy create growth? It's a very good idea to start off your consideration, your analysis, by trying to pick those terms apart and explain what you think they even mean, and then forging ahead with some sort of answer to the question. So let's get into it. Let's start with democracy. We'll deal with does in a minute. <laughs> I mean, I'm that pedantic, I would even define does. Here's a really cool map from an organization called Freedom House. And every year they publish a report called Freedom in the World. And it's pretty much the standard metric that we as political scientists and academics use of democracy. So technically speaking, they are measuring freedoms, but their freedoms measure civil and political rights which correspond very closely with our standard definitions of a proceduralist democracy. Now, <laughs> OK, the music's getting a bit racy. A proceduralist democracy is one that goes through the, the correct steps to being a democracy. In other words, it, it walks the democratic walk. There are others that might favour a more substantive definition of democracy. In other words, that wherein the people living in that particular community feel like they are participating, feel like they are members of a democracy. But that sort of sense of feeling is much more difficult to measure than a checklist of criteria. Does this country have regular free and fair elections? Yes or no. Does it have a free press? Yes or no. Does it give its citizens the right to protest, to uh, participate in trade unions? Does it give its citizens uh, access to information so that they can become informed on various topics. These are some relatively straightforward criteria that can be assessed. And what Freedom House uses are experts to perform that assessment. And they come up with a metric of all the world's countries as a result of this. And they can split the world into three different groups. Countries that are free and on this map colored in green. So you can see the US, Canada, most of Europe, um, much of South America, much of, well, not much of Southern Africa, um, but South Africa, Namibia and Botswana, um, Australia, New Zealand, and interestingly, Mongolia. So completely surrounded by purple, purple are not free countries. So China and Russia, fairly, un fairly unsurprisingly, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, etc. in South Asia. Um, the Middle East is mostly not free. Most of Africa is not free. Um, some of the countries in the Caribbean, specifically Cuba here, and this is Venezuela, are not free. And then yellow is partially free. So they're kind of hybrid. They're somewhere in between. They, they may be transitioning from one state to another, or they may just be sort of stuck in a hybrid state. Uh, so that would include countries such as, well, here we've got Peru, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, Colombia, uh, Mexico. Uh, in Africa, we've got quite a few countries in West Africa, with the exception of uh, Ghana, but we've got so Nigeria, which is not, which is partly free. Uh, and in East Africa, countries like Kenya, Tanzania, Madagascar, uh, Lesotho, 
which is a landlocked country in South Africa, is uh, partly free. Um, and India, interestingly, is partly free. That used to be classed as free, but has uh, since become partly free as a result of some of the actions taken by the um, by the Modi government. Um, Hungary has also been downgraded from a green free state to a partly free state. Um, and Turkey has gone to full on unfree, even though that was previously uh, a partly free and a free state. Anyway, it's just quite a cool map because it gives a sense of who's a, de who's a democracy. And because they've been doing these surveys for quite a few decades now, we've got these really beautiful time series data sets that can tell us how much a country's freedom has gone up, gone down, stayed the same and all the rest of it. And that allows us to ask and potentially answer quite a lot of interesting questions about democracy, including the one we're trying to answer this afternoon as to whether democracy creates growth. But please bear in mind that measuring democracy is a tricky business, right? Um, you know, it's not like taking out a ruler and measuring distances, albeit that comes with its own sort of potential problems for physicists and mathematicians. But anyway, measuring democracy or provi providing an operational definition, as we might sometimes technically call it, it's really hard and Freedom House does a very good job at it, but all of these metrics are to a greater or lesser extent flawed. Let me give you an example. The European Union, is the European Union a democracy? Now, in a procedural sense, in the sense of does it have the checklist of those freedoms that I mentioned at the start? Yeah, unambiguously, it's, it's free. Uh, and there are all of the usual accoutrements you would expect of a top class, democracy. And that's fairly unsurprising because one of the rules for joining the European Union is that the country that wants to join has to itself be democratic. But in that more sort of murky substantive sense, a lot of people suggest there isn't a demos in Europe, a demos being a group of people that feel like they are fully paid up citizens of a European democratic project. So that sense of identifying with the democratic project called the European Union is a bit harder to identify for some. So this is where the concept begin, begins to become a bit murkier. But anyway, for our purposes today, Freedom House and various other similar metrics do a perfectly adequate job. What about create? I mean, if we're asking, does democracy create uh, growth? We need to have some sense of create. Now, I don't want to sort of dig far too far into the depths of causation. But we should at least consider some of the essences of that word. If we're saying that A creates B, that suggests that A originates everything pertinent to B. Now, it seems pretty unlikely that democracy exclusively creates growth. And in fact, we could think of some outliers and we will discuss some outliers where there are countries that grow their economies fairly rapidly, but aren't democracy. So the idea that that democracy originates growth is obviously wrong. So create needs to be sort of downgraded to not entirely originate, but has some significant influence over growth. We also need to be very careful when we study what are called correlations. Correlations is a pattern between sets of data. And those patterns will often be described using a, a graph such as this one, where we might look for some sort of alignment between the X and Y axes. And that might literally be a straight line, which would be called a linear regression. Linear as in straight line and regression, meaning that you have lots of different points on the graph and you draw a line that is the regression to the mean between all of those points, okay? And that allows us to say that there is some sort of association between those variables. Why that association exists, the graph cannot tell us. So one thing you always have to be very careful of is that correlations don't mean causation. Just because you happen to find some association between data doesn't mean that you can say definitively that one variable has caused another. And here's a great example from a magnificent website, um, which I found called um, spuriouscorrelations.com. I think it's by a guy called Tyler Beenan, and it's just hilarious. Basically, he's found an incredibly tight correlation between the um, uh, between the release of a Nicolas Cage film, as in the Hollywood actor Nicolas Cage, and the number of people who drown by falling into a swimming pool. So <laughs> there is a correlation here, 
that there seems bizarrely enough to be an association between Nicolas Cage films being released and people drowning in swimming pools. But it would be quite absurd to suggest that they cause that Nicolas Cage films cause people to drown in swimming pools. So this is what I mean about the distinction between correlation and causation. You need to be very careful with that. And so we also need to be careful when we talk about what well, does democracy create growth? Well, OK, it doesn't originate growth. So if we are talking about create, then we're talking in a slightly sort of lesser sense of absolutely create from scratch. And also it may be associated with growth. In other words, rich countries may be democratic, but that could just be coincidental. There may be no causal relationship between those two things whatsoever. It could just be a pattern that's an accident, same as this pattern that we found between Nicolas Cage films and deaths in swimming pool. Okay, so please be very careful with, uh, with that distinction. And lastly, but by no means leastly, growth. Now, in a four word question, does democracy create growth? We would normally be left to assume that growth means economic growth. It's not unreasonable if you were asked this in an interview setting to seek some clarification from the interviewers just to confirm, do you mean economic growth? I mean, it's not going to mean sort of physical growth. Do democratic countries grow larger? <laughs> no, I mean, maybe in terms of population, possibly, um, but that in itself would probably be associated with economic growth. Um, but, you know, there are various other metrics of a country's success that are quite popular. So there might be, for example, um, the Human Development Index. And if you've heard of this, it's called HDI, which measures how the percentage of a population that are receiving excellent healthcare, for example, or the percentage of a population that get a good primary education, secondary education, tertiary education. These are metrics of human development that some people are that some people prefer over metrics of economic growth. Pretty much the standard measure of a country's success for a long time has been growth in the economy. Is the economy bigger this year than it was last year? And if it's bigger, then that means that everyone in theory is a little bit richer. Uh, and how you even measure that in itself is complicated. You could talk about gross domestic product, which is how much money is made within the, the territory of that country. Or you could talk about gross national product, which is the amount of money created by the nationals of that country, regardless of where they are in the world. Anyway, the point being is that that's how we typically construe growth. But there's some interesting debates as to whether that's actually what we should be paying attention to. Regardless, if we take log GDP, you know, log, the logarithmic measure of GDP just means that at very high levels, the, the difference between increasing increments becomes smaller. Um, so you do it, use a, a logarithm. Um, it's just to try and sort of make for better comparisons because the difference in the GDP of the US from say Burkina Faso is so vast that it could massively magnify other supposed differences. So a logarithm helps make more meaningful comparisons. Anyway, so we've got log gross domestic product on the x-axis, and that is correlated with democracy on the y-axis. And just as in the ordering of the alphabet, the implication is that x somehow causes y. Now, as I've already mentioned, you can't say on the basis of a graph like this that something is caused by something else. You can only say that there is a, a correlation. But the correlation looks pretty clear in this instance that as GDP per capita increases, democracy increases. The GDP per capita is an interesting choice because that's how much gross domestic product is distributed amongst the citizens. There are some countries that have very high levels of GDP, but not necessarily particularly high levels of GDP per capita. A clear example of this would be China. China has the world's second largest gross domestic product, second to the United States of America, but its GDP per capita is not even in the world's top 100. So because China has such a vast population and also has quite poorly distributed wealth, it's actually not particularly world class when it comes to GDP per capita, but it's outstandingly strong when it comes to raw GDP. So again, be very careful and keep an eye out for the measures that are being used. If someone plonks a graph like this in front of you in an interview, Look at all the details, read the axes, work out the, the units that are being utilized, ask questions about it, um, show that curiosity as to how the graph was produced because it will help you. Okay.
So we do see a reasonably clear association, what would be called a positive correlation, because as one goes up, the other goes up. But there are also some notable outliers, which we'll discuss in more detail later. Qatar, for example, is an intriguing one of a country with a high GDP per capita, but without a particularly high rate of democracy. Um, and Mali is at the opposite extreme, which is a country with relatively high democracy score, but a low GDP per capita. OK, anyway, so there seems to be some sort of association, but why that association might exist is interesting because we can't say does democracy create growth unless we can explain why there might be this correlation. OK, what about does? Now, you might fairly suggest that I'm being magnificently pedantic here, but that's pretty much what academics are paid to do. So you kind of have to play the game. But when we say does democracy create growth, one sort of question begging is, well, maybe it did create growth, but doesn't anymore, or maybe it will create growth. I mean, does implies that it's it's present continuous, that democracies are creating growth, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, rah, 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 growth, 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 growth. But it is possible that democracies were the motors of growth during industrialization, but have lost their Im impact in more recent generations. Who knows? Anyway, democracy itself seems to have come and gone in a wave pattern, which is really interesting. Uh, political scientist from Harvard called Samuel Huntington described the three waves of democratization. The first wave being countries such as the United Kingdom and the US that democratized in the first long wave up till about the end of the First World War when there was a regression impacted by the war itself and countries such as Germany, Italy, Spain moved towards dictatorships in the interwar period. Uh, so that was the first sort of peak and then trough in the waveform. Then after the Second World War, there was another shift towards democratization. Quite a lot of countries were effectively forced to democratize by having been conquered. So most obvious examples of that will be, um, of course, Germany, Austria, Italy, Japan, South Korea. Um, then there were other parts of the world that effectively took sides in the Cold War and decided to democratize in order to ingratiate themselves with the United States. But there was a second reversion in the late 50s and 60s, again, to a certain extent, spurred by the Cold War insofar as the Soviet Union brought under its ambit countries that it then encouraged to move away from democracy and capitalism. And we see from the end of the Cold War another sort of spike in countries becoming democratic. There was a suggestion that the so-called Arab Spring that kicked off about 10 years ago might launch a fourth wave of democratization, but that uh, seems to have come to nothing. If anything, the world is less free since the Arab Spring than it was before, according to Freedom House. Anyway, even a verb like does is deserving of your critical attention in, a, in a, an essay or an interview setting. OK, so let's uh, let's get into the weeds of it. So why democracy? Um, I mean, before we try and work out whether democracy creates growth, um, we should talk about what democracy is and why it is a relatively popular form of government around the world. You may well be familiar already with the etymology of the word democracy. In other words, its literal meaning and the origins of the word it comes from Greek demos, meaning the people, kratos, meaning power. So fairly literally power for the people. Some of the earliest recorded democracies were in Greek city states, wherein citizens, now citizens in those days were, were free white men, uh, not slaves, uh, would be able to vote in public settings on certain matters. And it was direct democracy. So you, didn't, you wouldn't necessarily have representatives. You would certainly have people that would, uh, would advocate for policies, but you wouldn't have someone that would vote on your behalf. You, if you were a citizen, could vote for yourself. So that was the sort of ancient Athenian Spartan model of democracy. Um, but we've, of course, moved quite substantially away from that with two, in particularly, two particularly important adjectives that are used these days to qualify the term democracy, representative 
and liberal. Representative democracy meaning that it is now indirect. In most large countries, it would simply be unfeasible to directly orchestrate public policy with each individual voting on each matter. So what we do is we delegate that responsibility to representatives. So members of parliament in the UK, members of the Senate in Wales, uh, congressmen in the US. We delegate our authority to those people and then they take decisions on our behalf. And if we don't like those decisions, then we can kick them out at the next election in theory. So that's representative democracy and liberal democracy is this idea that there are certain limits to what that democracy can do. You cannot have a tyranny of the majority because there are certain absolute freedoms that are sacrosanct regardless of what majorities may wish to achieve. So, for example, you have strong protections on freedom of speech because it's not inconceivable that a majority could come into power and decide, oh, well, we don't like all of this negative press coverage, so we'll ban newspapers and we'll take them under state control. But then that, of course, makes it harder for minorities to contribute to future decision making processes because they can't complain about it. And they can't become informed about it. So a democracy can't transgress those freedoms without ceasing to be a democracy. So you can't have absolute majority power and still be a democracy. There has to be some sort of fallback position, which we would usually call a liberal democracy. Anyway, one of my favorite definitions of democracy is that it's institutionalized uncertainty. Now, this comes from a man called Adam Shavorsky, another political scientist. And it's such a beautiful definition of democracy. Just hold that in your mind for a little second. Institutionalized uncertainty seems kind of like a contradiction in terms. Institutions are rules. They are procedures. They are fixed processes for achieving certain outcomes. And uncertainty is seemingly the opposite of that. So why would we set up this elaborate set of rules and then at the end of that sort of neatly defined process, you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> you have carefully constructed a procedure that yields uncertainty. What? What? Why would you do that? That seems madness, right? Um, <laughs> the idea is that, that the process is what really matters to democracy. It's the capacity for people to take decisions. The final decisions themselves, the substance, the outputs, yeah, they matter, but ultimately what really matters is, are those decisions reflective of public opinion? Are, can the decision makers be held accountable? Uh, can the public become informed uh, as to how those decisions could have been different? You know, those are the, the key parts of the process of democratization. We want a really careful, tight, rule-bound system for making decisions, but what those decisions actually are isn't hugely important. Indeed, if you were to go into a democracy saying, well, we'll guarantee certain outcomes, that would definitionally be undemocratic because it would mean that certain future generations couldn't change their criteria of success. So you can't say we are institutionalized economic growth machines because then future generations might say, yeah, but economic growth is killing the planet. So we need to dial that back and we need to push forward with some other goals. So that's partly why democratic theory is interested in the institutions and the rules, not necessarily so fast with the outcomes. Anyway, um, where does democracy come from? Well, one, well not one, but a set of theories tends to focus on power. And that's often the answer to most political science questions. <laughs> Why does this thing happen? Because power. Might is right. Or in this instance, might gives rights in the sense that people having power can take power away from the erstwhile elites. So what used to happen in sort of feudal or aristocratic societies is that there were a smallish group of individuals who held the levers of power and they did so through economic, political, cultural, social means, but most, most importantly economics. Back in pre-industrial Britain, for example, the way to have control was to have property rights. If you owned the property, you owned the land, you could extract rents from that land and you were basically untouchable. You had 
loads of money, but you also had political influence and you had all of the other sort of cascading power that came from the fact that you owned land. And that was pretty much all that mattered. As a result of the explosion of economic opportunities that emerged during industrialization, that sort of small band of highly uh, influential elites were broken up simply by being challenged from industrialists and others who were able to generate income and value and therefore generate power. So they didn't need to be pushed around by this small aristocratic elite anymore. They could say, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I've got my own source of income. Why do I need to listen to you anymore? So in the words of, um, of a great uh, political sociologist called Barrington Moore, no bourgeoisie, no democracy. In other words, without a, a vibrant middle class, you ain't going to get democracy because what democracy fundamentally takes is the wide distribution of power in a society. And that was a point made by Asimoglu and Robinson. So it's not that the, the gross amount of power in a society that matters, it's how it's distributed. And if it's distributed to lots of people, then it's going to be very difficult for a dictator or a cabal of you know oligarchs to control them. And so when you look at countries today that are autocratic or dictatorial or otherwise authoritarian, they have concentrated power because they can concentrate power. Somewhere like Russia doesn't have terribly well distributed economic power and therefore the Russian citizens struggle to take what could arguably be rightfully theirs. China similarly, as I've already mentioned, has an enormous amount of economic wealth as a collective, but on an individual per capita basis, it's not terribly well distributed. So it's very difficult for individual Chinese citizens to challenge the, the almighty power of the Politburo in Beijing. So it's all about how economic forces release power from this small elite out to lots of other people. Okay, um, that's the sort of the economic side of it. There are, of course, philosophical arguments for democracy, not least of which that <clears throat> is that it treats people as equals, that you can't conceive of a democracy where certain groups of citizens are arbitrarily thought of as lesser than others. And that means, to my mind, that the UK, as an example, was not a fully fledged democracy until 1928, because that was the year at which finally men and women were able to vote on equal terms. That arbitrarily saying prior to that stage that women didn't have a right to participate on the same state on the same grounds as men, that's not democracy. So there is a philosophical as well as an economic driver. Which one comes first is a bit of a chicken and egg question. Did people have to take power away from elites by basically sort of straining the money away from them and then asserting their new, their new powers? Or was there a bit of a mixture of not only that sort of taking of material power with also the sort of dissemination of ideas that it's just wrong to treat people a certain way and treat them unequally for no good reason. Um, and connected to that sense of justice is this amazing contribution by uh, a man called John Rawls, who came up with this with his groundbreaking theory of justice, in which he describes the concept of a veil of ignorance, wherein if you try to work out what's the most just decision to take, imagine that you're behind a veil of ignorance and you have no idea who you are or what your power is, what decision would you take from that position of absolute ignorance? Let's say, for example, that you're trying to work out how to uh, distribute certain goods amongst a society, but you don't know if you're male or female, you don't know if you're black, white, or of any other sort of um, racial description. You have no idea because you're behind the veil of ignorance. What sort of distribution would you think of then? Chances are that on the basis of that veil of ignorance, you choose whichever is the most equitable, fair distribution, because you can't assume that you will be the lucky beneficiary of it. The problem we often have in decision making is that people with privilege and power make decisions consciously or unconsciously that further their own interests. So people say, well, I'm going to take this decision that favours white men, for example, because I'm a white man and I think we probably deserve this power. <laughs> Whereas if as John Rawls suggests, we put ourselves behind the veil of ignorance. All of a sudden you think, well, but what if I'm not a white man? What happens then? And it seems kind of obvious when you say it out loud like that, that we should you know, have empathy for people that are not privileged. But um, 
you know, a lot of people, frankly, don't have that capacity for empathy, and they have uh, they have become sort of deluded to the notion of their own their own righteousness just because they have more power. But of course, them having more power could just be a, a silly accident of history and and luck rather than their own good works. So so there's a bit of philosophy and ideology as well as economics. But I'm kind of tempted by the the argument that it's basically ultimately just comes down to, to money, that um, the reason we have democracies in, in the 21st century and we didn't in the 12th century is because of the Industrial Revolution just unleashed the power of little people and dragged it out of the hands of very powerful elites. It just destroyed feudalism. I mean, some historians don't even believe feudalism ever existed, but you know, let's just sort of park some of those um, intellectual debates and at least agree that power was highly concentrated in the past. Okay, um, there are some other uh, arguments that are presented as to why democracy emerged or why it didn't emerge in certain contexts, because there are some interesting patterns of democracy distribution around the world. Some would argue that democracy is founded on that notion of skepticism that John Rawls was getting at. You know, imagine if you were ignorant of your position in the world, what decisions would you take then? Well, quite a lot of people would suggest that democracy, by being an institutional process that yields uncertainty, is derived from a Western tradition of doubt. The Western philosophy, if you go all the way back to the to the ancient Greeks, is based on this notion of how little we know, not how much we know. And so that would therefore suggest that we should take decisions collectively and we should discuss them and we should argue because we don't know the correct answers. If we knew the answers, if we knew what the universe was telling us, then we wouldn't bother discussing it, would we? So it could be that democracy is quite a Western mindset and it's derived from Matthew, you've muted yourself. Oh, thank you. Hopefully not for too long. Was was that? How long have I been silent? About 30 seconds. Oh, OK. All right. Thank you for pointing that out. OK, so sorry. What I was saying is that uh, I'll just recap quickly, um, is that um, some would argue that um, democracy is fundamentally a Western ideology because it's derived from this notion of doubt that the reason that we have discussions, that we argue, that we have elections, that we fight things out intellectually is because we simply don't know the, the right answers. And that's not an ideological mindset that other philosophical traditions share necessarily. Um, for example, uh, there had been arguments that, that uh, people from uh, countries that are inured in Confucian thought, such as China, most notably Taiwan, don't necessarily share this sense of uncertainty. They, they're not, they're not, the way they make decisions is not predicated on, I don't know, it's predicated on, I think I do know. So let's not bother discussing it. Um, now, these are very controversial arguments, by the way. These are sort of culturalist arguments that suggest that certain cultures just can't do democracy. They will never do democracy. And that could be considered to be demeaning to those cultures, or it could be considered to be just plain wrong. So we do, do need to be very careful, but it is interesting how certainly countries that are either in the West or have been heavily influenced by Western colonization are more likely to be democracies than countries that have come from a different cultural tradition. Um, religion similarly is said to be a part of that story, in particular in countries where there was a clash between religious and secular forces there seems to have been more likely to develop a democracy because you've got a bit of a separation of powers and, and checks and balances. Um, so, for example, the early uh, Church of England or, or before that, when when um, 
you know, there was a clash between the archbishops of Canterbury and the kings, there was a sort of butting of heads and there was a separation of power. Both had a lot of economic power and land and might and all the rest of it. And they were constantly sort of smashing heads such that it, it became institutionalized that you had these this division of powers. And so drifting from that into a more sort of uh, dis, uh, sort of, uh, disaggregated democracy is not too much of an intellectual leap of imagination. Whereas in some other countries, there's not been such a clear separation of different sources of authority. Again, China is the classic example of this. In uh, in early sort of Chinese imperial periods, there wasn't a split between different sources of authority. So the populace in China were only looking in one direction, which would be to the emperor. The emperor would be the top of the, the tree. And as a result of the Chinese revolution, they just switched one source of autocracy with another. It wasn't that they had this sort of ready-made set of different competing sources of power going on. I mean, some would go further still and make a very, frankly very controversial argument that democracy is fundamentally Protestant um, in its uh, in its origins, um, that even Catholicism struggles with, or at least struggled with democracy. Um, now, this argument has been posed by Samuel Huntington again, and it is highly controversial, so do please be careful. So he suggests that Protestantism is more likely to be connected to democracy because in Protestantism, each individual has a direct connection with God. They don't have to have it mediated by a source of authority, such as a priest or ultimately the Pope. And so they are quite independent minded and individualistic. And that's an important mindset for anyone that wants to get involved in democracy. If you are conversely uh, dependent on a very powerful figure like the Pope and priests in order to mediate your influence with God, then that might influence your mindset in other walks of life. I suppose the problem with that argument is that it suggests that people can't think differently in different areas of their life, or indeed that you know the papacy and priests are as authoritative as they perhaps once were. And in the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, the Pope uh, himself said, we aren't going to support dictators anymore. So the papacy ironically used its authority and power to crush other autocracies around the world. So the point is, please take those arguments with a massive pinch of salt, but they're interesting to consider. A similar line of argument suggests that other religions such as Islam don't necessarily uh, make for uh, propitious circumstances for democracy. Again, magnificently controversial, uh, and it more seems to be a correlation analysis rather than a causal analysis. There doesn't seem to be very good reasons why Islam could not uh, could not work as a functioning democracy. And so more just to be, seems to be a case that lots of countries that are Islamic are not democracies. And so people have made that correlation into a causal assessment, which doesn't seem entirely appropriate. But you think about it for yourself. I'm not going to tell you my thoughts on it. Um, the, the other sort of things to think about are other ideological facets like capitalism and communism. Under communism, all property is owned communally. And so the idea that each individual has a right to contribute to decision making is kind of pointless. So, again, that doesn't necessarily fit very easily with democracy. OK, um, when we are trying to uh, uh, answer, does democracy create growth? There are various possibilities when it comes to the direction of causation. So we've already discussed the possibility that neither democracy nor growth uh, are actually causing each other, that they could just be completely coincidental. Another possibility that I suggested is that the causal direction is inverted, that actually economic growth causes democracy, or at least it did cause democracy to flourish as a result of the Industrial Revolution. I'm kind of sold on that argument, but there are still some limitations in, in what that can tell us about the uh, distribution of democracy around the world. Um, there could also be what's known as endogeneity, which means that democracy and growth could feed back on each other, that they are not independent of each other. So as democracy develops, economies grow, and as economies grow, democracy develops, and there's the positive feedback. Another idea of endogeneity is that both democracy and economic growth are endogenous inside another sort of causal mechanism. So they may be 
associated, but there's a much bigger story going on that we're not looking at that we need to zoom out and try and work out what's that emitted variable that's really causing both democracy and growth. And it could be, you know, spread of education, for example. Uh, the spread of education helps growth and helps democracy, but we're not necessarily talking about it directly here. So we need to be careful that sometimes when we see these patterns in data, we'll work out, are we suggesting the correct direction of causation? Or maybe there's a feedback loop, which means that drawing it on a graph is going to be a waste of time. Or maybe there's a third or fourth or fifth variable that we're not talking about that's even more important than the two that we have happened to fixate on at this moment. OK, so I promised to have a quick chat about outliers, you know, those countries that seem not to fit the bill. Uh, we've already discussed China, which is magnificently rich as a country, but not democracy, of course. Um, and one of the key explanations for that, as I mentioned, was that the distribution of that wealth is not terribly even. So although China is the world's second largest economy, its GDP per capita doesn't even put it in the world's top 100. And so the wealth it has is concentrated in a small or smallish, relatively small number of people. And so there isn't an incentive to disrupt the current authoritarian government in China. Put simply, people don't have enough power to demand more rights, more freedoms. The government can control them much more easily. Um, some other interesting outliers would include the Gulf states. So as you can see, countries like Kuwait and Qatar, uh, Jordan, um, Saudi Arabia could be on this list as well. These are very rich countries and indeed rich per capita as well, but not democracies. Now, again, someone like Samuel Huntington might point a finger at Islam as being part of that story. I'm honestly not sold on that. I don't think there's any particularly clear reasons why Islam could not uh, could not cohere with democracy. I think more likely in those instances, the issue is what's known as sometimes as the resource curse or the oil curse. Countries that have a, a source of wealth, which is found in a fixed location, often have the curse of making money from that resource rather than from the hard work of people. Because essentially what you're making money from is property rights. So basically, these countries that make a lot of money out of oil are making money in a similar way to how um, you know, feudal lords made money in the past. They happen to own the right to the land on which the oil is drilled, and that's what makes their money. And it's not like your average QAT or Qatari can compete with that because they can't own the land. But as you can see from this graph, there is relatively high GDP per capita, and that's possibly because in those countries, individual citizens are given lots of generous tax breaks or they're brought into the economy of oil because they can effectively be bought off. The economy of oil is so strong that there is no incentive to democratize. And there's no incentive to share the re the rights to the to the power of oil, and so quite a lot of the countries that you may remember from that map at the start that are not free, interestingly, are countries that have extraordinarily high oil reserves. Venezuela is an example. Nigeria is an example. Some Central Asian countries. What are not examples are countries that found oil after they democratized like the USA, like Canada, like Norway, like Britain. These countries found quite large oil reserves, but they already had in place the institutions of democracy. So the, the resource had to be factored into that political economic structure and couldn't disrupt it. It's not just oil, by the way, other sort of expensive resources that are fixed in a fixed location, like copper, like uh, cadmium, like lithium that are mined in certain countries can have a similar effect on politics. Basically, there becomes a big old fight over the land and who owns the land. And it's not really a fight in which many other people can compete. And so you tend not to see democracies there. As regards countries that are dem democratic without having much money or much growth, the explanation there could be that they are have incentives from other countries, that they are kind of being pushed into it. So, for example, they may be surrounded by other democracies or they may want to try and ingratiate themselves into a into a democratic club. There may be local ideological reasons for it. 
there, there are a whole host of different factors that could explain why a country is democratic despite being basically poor um, that we could factor in. But it's worth noting that, you know, there are a lot of outliers to this trend and it does suggest that it's not a particularly well fitting model and that we could probably do a lot to make it better. So the relationship between growth and democracy needs a lot of finessing, I would suggest. OK, what's next? Well, you may be aware that Boris Johnson is talking about establishing the D10 initiative. So this is to try and uh, go alongside the G7, G7 being the seven richest economies. The D10 will expand that group to include three other democracies as a bit of a bulwark against the growing influence and power of China and Russia in particular, to try and make a stand for democracies in the 21st century. Because to be frank, the future for democracy in the 21st century is bleak. Um, there was a bit of a sort of messianic feeling, you know, at the end of the Cold War that democracy had won the game of international politics and was the only sort of plausible model available. And that effectively we were waiting for the whole world to democratize and that was just a matter of time. Now, that doesn't seem so obvious. And by the end of this century, I wouldn't be surprised if democracy becomes a minority pastime once again, given the strength and growing importance of autocracies around the world. I look forward to being proven wrong on that one, but the way trends are currently going, it's not doesn't give me much cause for optimism. Um, and what are some of the sort of potential threats? Well, with climate change, we're likely to see ecological collapse and large scale migrations of people. We're also going to see further destabilization of economies, which will have political impacts. It could put a lot of people under stress, and that often yields more power to authorities because when people are vulnerable and stressed, they can be manipulated and controlled somewhat more easily. And we've seen plenty of examples of that already. And I fear that with increasing effects of climate change, that that influence could only become greater. Um, we've also seen deteriorating international relations, especially between uh, China, Russia and the rest of the world. You could throw Brazil into that mix under Jair Bolsonaro, but that's not an authoritarian regime technically. And it looks like he's going to be kicked out fairly soon. But I think fundamentally the key international relations problems for the whole world are how do we get along better with China and Russia? And that's not just the Chinese and Russian problem, by the way. Um, and related to that is ideological distance, not only between countries, but within countries. The polarization between Brexiteers and Remainers, between Republicans and Democrats, between Scottish nationalists and unionists. These are problems that could undermine democracy and may need to be addressed. But there are some points to be very optimistic about that we should emphasize as well. For one thing, educational opportunities for young women and girls have been expanding rapidly around the world. This has had a whole range of influences on improving economic growth for many countries, uh, reducing the birth rates, increasing social welfare provision, uh, improving democracies. So one of the classic sort of go-to fixes for any development question is educate girls. You'll improve health, you'll improve education, you'll improve welfare, you'll improve democracy. Almost everything improves if you secure that. So given that we've seen a lot of that happen already, that should give us some grounds for tentative optimism, but it has to increase for there to be a sustained Im impact. We're also seeing that green technologies are becoming cheaper than fossil fuels. And this means that the resource curse of things like oil may cease to have quite as much purchase in the near future. The, the dependence on parts of the world like the Middle East will cease and the power of, of some of those autocracies will therefore disappear. Russia makes pretty much all of its uh, money, well not all of it, but a lot of its money from oil and gas and it could basically lose its influence in the world if that no longer is needed in order to heat our homes and run our cars and all the rest of it. So Russia could potentially be in a lot of trouble if it doesn't change its model quite quickly. Um, there's also 
leverage and linkage, in other words, countries using things like the D10 or the European Union are working together to try and create the incentives for democracy and growth at the same time to make for a more peaceful, stable world. Um, and, you know, a, a, a rules based system, as it's often described, of world interactions. Um, and that seems to have yielded a lot of influence, certainly uh, in Western Europe, there's been a lot of impact in, in that regard, and in parts of Africa as well. So there's potentially causes for optimism there. There's certainly a will, but whether that leads to people finding a way remains to be seen. Anyway, so does democracy create growth? Personally, I'm probably more minded to say that growth created democracy, but doesn't necessarily create it in a present continuous sense. But as ever, I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Um, so thank you very much for listening and watching. And uh, yeah, I'll hand it over to you to tell me what you think. Thank you.